So we'd like to welcome everyone to the Gospel meeting this morning. And for those that are here in this building, but also those that are watching online, um, we're thankful that the Lord has given us the opportunity to speak the Gospel, the good news of salvation. And um, what I have on my mind uh, today to talk about is the subject that actually the Lord Jesus Christ talked about more than any other subject. Now, some people think it might be salvation, or it might be a place called heaven, or it might be about faith, but actually the thing that the Lord Jesus spoke about more than anything else was money. And I don't want to speak about money specifically, but I want to speak about some aspect of it and some uh, aspect of the value or the worth or the cost of something. And so I, I kind of titled this message, um, How Much Does It Cost? And um, the thing that I think is interesting is, is that different things have different value to different people. So for example, you may have seen the story in the news a couple of weeks ago. Um, sometimes you hear about this where a man, I think it was at a flea market, he purchased some old photographs um, for $4 and it turned, turns out that one of the photographs was um, one of the only two foot known photographs of um, Billy the Kid um, from the 1800s, a notable outlaw in the Wild West. And that um, first photo of Billy the Kid did something like $2 million at auction for, the, for one photo, and they were estimating that this uh, particular photo would do much more than that. Now. I have some photos that I care about, photos of my family, um, you know, photos of, of different things that we've done together as a family, you know, our wedding album, but there's no photo that I would place that kind of value on of $4 million. And yet there are people in the world that will pay because they think that it's worth it. And I, I kind of had this occasion recently when I was at uh, Kohl's and um, I bought a watch and I liked this watch, and it was pretty inexpensive. It was on sale for $17.99, and I'm not a big fan of spending a lot of money on watches, and so I liked it, but then I took it home, and then a few days later, the second hand fell off and was sort of moving around inside the face of the watch. And so um, eventually I went back, and long story short, when I went back um, and found another, she said, well, go find another watch over there, and so I found it, and I bring it over, and she rings it up, and it was $39.99 plus tax. It was $40, $40-some dollars. And I said, well, what's, what's the story? I just, I paid $17.99 for that. And she said, well, they're no longer on sale. And so you, you don't get the sale price. You have to pay the regular price. And so I looked at the watch, and I asked her again, how much is it? And then I just made a decision in that moment that it wasn't worth it to me. And I said, you know what, I'll just get my cash back. And that's what I did. That watch wasn't worth that much to me. And we all make those decisions every day. Um, and and uh, we place value on different things. And so I was wondering, just to kind of illustrate the point, and uh, you young folks in the front row, or for that matter, the front two rows, uh, there's a couple things up here that you might uh, be able to pay attention to and have an answer for. Um, and then I put one on here for uh, those of us that are a little older. So what I did was I went on the internet and I decided to look up what some of the hot toys are for this Christmas season and then see if you have any idea how much it would cost. So what we have here is Statue of Liberty Barbie. I'll bet you didn't know we had Statue of Liberty Barbie, did you? No. But we have pretty much every Barbie that you can imagine. So um, makes me feel very patriotic when I look at that. Um, but the Statue of Liberty Barbie apparently is a hot toy this Christmas, and I'd like for you to look at these four prices, and you decide what you think, A, the Statue of Liberty Barbie actually sells for on ToysRUs.com, but also think about what you would pay. Some of you wouldn't pay a nickel for it. Um, but So to how many of you think that it's A, $18.99? Raise your hand. A couple, okay. What about $54.99? Raise your hand. Statue of Liberty Barbie. Um, $31.99, letter C, a few of you, okay. And what about $129.99? Okay, so there was at least there was at least one vote for every single answer, which is very interesting because sometimes these collectible Barbies, I mean, they're worth a ton of money, 
The actual answer is C, $31.99 is what the price is on um, ToysRUs.com. And so um, there's another hot toy. This is in the top 15 hot toys for Christmas. Everybody wants a drone, apparently, okay? And this is a Sky Viper drone, which sounds really cool. Sky Viper drone with video streaming, meaning that not only will it take video and then when it comes back to you, you can take the little card out of it, but you can actually live stream the video on your device while it's flying around, okay? Seems perfectly safe and good for privacy for Americans, right? But um, I'm sure there are no teenagers that will get in trouble with this um, over Christmas break. But there are three prices here. So how many of you think that it's A, $319.99? Okay, a few of you. Um, B is $89.99. Anybody? Okay. C is $159.99. Anybody? Okay. And $49.99. D. Okay, one person, and she doesn't have a lot of money. So that one, we all, we all know that this is, this is a fairly expensive item, but we're not sure how expensive it is. This specific drone was $89.99 at ToysRUs.com. And so, um, you know, the, the, the different values that people place, and, you know, this is a little bit like the Price is Right, where you, you just sort of look at something, and some people, they, they know for sure how much something costs, or they think that they do. Now, speaking of Price is Right, of course, something that is the highlight of that show is when they give away a brand new car. And so this is the number one selling car in the United States over the past year. This is a 2015 Ford Fusion, and the one that I picked was the SE 2.0 liter all-wheel drive fully loaded. In other words, this is the Ford Fusion that you could buy with all the things that come with it, um, the all-wheel drive, obviously, for going in the snow, and the best engine that you can get in that car, all of those things, and I put four prices up there. So how many of you think it's A for the Ford Fusion? 27,000, okay, a couple. B, 23,280, anybody, okay? C is 19,977, anybody? D is 33,110, okay. So again, I mean, this, this one is $27,830. When you think about it, okay, you look at that car, and then you think about how much money $27,000 is, that is a lot of money for a car. And, but it's the best-selling car in America. And I'm assuming that's because it's dependable, it's probably very economical on gas, and comes in different colors, and all the different reasons why a car would be popular to buy. But the point is, is that everything has a price and everything has a value. And I want to apply that now to some things that we read about in the Bible that are very, very important because when we talk about the price of a car or the price of a house or the price of a toy, those are all different prices, but there's something that's more valuable than anything in this world or in the universe, and we're going to figure out what that is. One thing that's very, very valuable is actually inside of you right now, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And there's something else that's even more valuable, and that existed in tangible form on the earth about 2,000 years ago. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about, or even if you are, let's read a few verses together, and it'll help us, it'll help make sense. So this is a verse from Genesis chapter 3, and um, this is when Adam and Eve were in the garden. And they had sinned, and they realized that they were naked, and they covered themselves with the fig leaves that they made. And God said, that's not good enough. And he killed an animal, and it says, The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And so when, I, when, you, when we read these verses, I want you to try and figure out what the thing is that we're talking about that has great value. And there's another very uh, famous passage in the New Testament that talks about something that was of great value, and the Lord told a parable. It's a, it's a story that is something that people would understand. It's an earthly meaning. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and then he would apply it to some truth that he was trying to communicate to his disciples or the people that were listening. And so in Matthew 13, the Lord Jesus says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, 
who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. And we'll come back to that parable in a minute because this is a beautiful picture of salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the value of your soul and my soul. And then there's an interesting verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this verse is the very end of 19 and part of verse 20. It says, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now think about that. It says that you, me, you were bought with a price. And we know, because some of you are old enough to have learned this in school, that many years ago in the United States of America in the 1800s, that there were actually people that were bought for a price. And they were called slaves. And slavery still exists in some places upon our, our earth today. And people were purchased with a price, but of course that's not what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about. Although when he wrote these words, there were people that had slaves. He's talking about something different, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Another verse, two more verses that I want to look at, is Jesus is hanging on the cross, and when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. John 19 and 40. Jesus said, it is finished. And then the final uh, verse, 1 Peter 6 and 20. Knowing that you were ransomed, that means uh, paying to set something free. Um, the word redeemed and ransomed are kind of similar words, and, but they are a little different. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. And this is the part of the verse that I think is most important. Not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And we'll come back to that, but what I'm interested in that end of that verse is the word precious. It says the precious blood of Christ. So we're going to talk about three different points today, and the first is the price of sin. You know, when you think about the price of sin, let's just say in our country, in America, we could say that the price of sin would be um, all of the people that are in um, the hospital um, from being, let's say, drug addicted to drugs or maybe from um, being an alcoholic or maybe someone that's in a hospital that was um, hit by a drunk driver. Um, the people who have lost their homes and lost their families and and lost their and their marriages are ruined because of gambling you know my one I, I think it was one of my kids pointed out recently you know we're driving along and you hear a commercial and maybe it's for Rivers Casino and a 30 second commercial 28 seconds is for all of the amazing things at Rivers Casino and then the last two or three seconds it says if you have a gambling problem dial 1-800-GAMBLER okay they have to put that on there just like you have to put a warning label on cigarettes that you have to say that alcohol can become something that you become addicted to. But I can remember, um, you know, you want to talk about the price of sin. This is going to sound like kind of a strange story, but several years ago, um, when my daughters, when we were at Wilson, one of my daughters had a friend that lived down towards um, Washington County, down in that area. And the family was, um, was pretty wealthy. The dad had a, had a really successful business. And so at the Meadows Racetrack and Casino, down in the basement, they had opened this brand new bowling alley, and then they actually had this private party room that had like four lanes in it, and all the glass was tinted, and you go in there, and they have like all this food, and they have big screen TVs, and they have all of this cool stuff that you can go in there and just have your private little party, and there was a birthday party there. So, you know, I figure I'm going to drive all the way out there from my house, and so I actually brought some Bible 12 tests to study. So there I am downstairs from the casino with all the race, horse racing going on and all the gambling, and I'm sitting there correcting Bible tests, which I thought was kind of ironic. But the interesting thing that happened when I was sitting there is there's this man, and he's probably in his late 20s, I would guess, and he comes along, and, and he's on his cell phone, and he's talking to one of his buddies, and he says, you know what? He says, I had to borrow, he said, I had to borrow uh, $10 from my dad, because um, I didn't have any money, and, and I put $7 in the gas tank just so I could get here, and I just put $3 on a horse, and it came in second, and I turned that $3 into $5. 
And he was so excited because he was telling this guy on the phone what race he was going to bet that $5 on, okay? And so when you think about the price of sin, how we as a, as, as a world, um, how long was it into the book of Genesis when the world was destroyed because of a flood because of sin? And all of the different things that can happen because of sin. But if you think about it, the verse that we read together that I chose to be specific about the price of sin is that sin, that this animal died, the first thing that ever died on the earth. Because in the Garden of Eden, things didn't die. Everything was alive. But because of sin, God killed an animal and its blood was shed and then he pulled the skin and the coat off of that animal and made coverings to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. So if we want to talk about the price of sin, sin equals death and blood. From the very beginning, God has a plan. He has a pattern and he has a principle. And that is the only way that sins can be covered or that sins can be forgiven is that something has to die and blood has to be shed. And the reason that the word vegetables up there is up there might be kind of strange if you don't know the story and know what I'm about to talk about. But there were two brothers, the sons of these two people who had been covered with the skin of the first animal that ever died. And these brothers were named Cain and Abel. And Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. And Cain, he needed to make an offering to God. It was time to make an offering to God for his sin. And so he went and he found the best fruits and vegetables, the most beautiful ones that he could find. And I can just picture him arranging them on a platter and just piled high with all of the things that he could grow as a farmer and offering them to God. And his brother Abel went and he looked and he found a lamb in his flock and he killed it and its blood was shed and he offered that lamb to God. And the Bible says that God had respect for Abel's offering, but that God had no respect for Cain's offering. You might say, well, wait a second. That doesn't seem very fair. Abel worked really hard to come up with those vegetables and those fruits. He worked really hard to arrange it very nicely so that God would look at that and say, thank you, that, that's, a, that's a good offering. But an acceptable offering has to be one where blood is shed and something dies because that's how serious sin is to God. Sin is serious business to God. You know, sin may not be serious business to us because, you know, I, I say this at school sometimes because we, we will hear it, we'll get a phone call and it'll be a person that their family maybe has been in the school for a long time and they seem very happy and then all of a sudden we hear that they're transferring to this other school and even though they're Jewish and even though they've been very happy in the school and all these different reasons that they seem very happy, when they talk to my boss or talk to the admissions director, they have this whole explanation as to why they need to go to this certain school. And, and I often say, you know what, I think as human beings that we can talk ourselves into or talk ourselves out of pretty much anything. We can rationalize pretty much anything. We can come up with some reason why we need that, you know, huge flat screen TV or why we need that motorcycle or why we need whatever, fill in the blank. Or for that matter, not that having a motorcycle or having a flat screen TV is a sin, but even to take it a step further, and if we're doing some sin in our life, what do we do? Well, we start to compare ourselves to other people that are worse than us. Or we start to complain about the rule and say, you know, the Bible, that, that, that's an old-fashioned rule that says that I can't do this or can't do that. And, or we get angry at the person that created the rule and then we, we have a problem with God. And so we tend to justify ourselves with what sins we commit. And so the vegetables weren't a good enough offering. Blood had to be shed. And we can't get into heaven the, with prayers or penance. The word penance means that we do something to make up for our sins. You know, where I was raised, um, in the religion that I was raised in, when you would sin, um, every so often you would go and you would go to confession and you would say um, to the priest how many sins you had committed and what they were, and then he would give me penance. And he would say, well, your penance is to say ten 
Our Fathers and ten Hail Marys, and um, then don't try not to sin anymore. And so then I would leave, and I would go, and I would say my ten Hail Mary prayers and my ten Our Father prayers, and then I was under the impression that my sins were gone, at least until I sinned the next time. And that's what penance is, at least as I understood it when I was a kid. And so no amount of good works, let's, let's compare the vegetables to good works. You know, um, Cain, he really tried. He tried his best. He did the best that he could, and he brought it forward. And God said, your good works, the best that you can do, that's not what I want. And no amount of prayers, you know, praying and just pleading with God and saying that, you know, uh, or, or quoting Bible verses or going to church or whatever it might be, and no amount of, of um, feeling sorry about what you've done. Now, that, that's a good thing, to feel sorry about the sin that you've committed. Um, repentance means that you're, you're sorry enough to change your behavior, but in and of itself, if we look back one verse, it says that he made garments of skins and he clothed them. They saw their nakedness as the re revealing of their sin, and he had to cover that nakedness, and so how did he do it? He did it by killing an animal. So something had to die. That's God's pattern. That's God's demonstrating something that was a signpost that was pointed ahead to a moment that would happen outside of Jerusalem on a little hill called Calvary. This was the first lesson in that Old Testament textbook to point ahead to that moment at Calvary. The second thing that I want to talk about is that little story, that verse that we read about the um, pearl of great price. And the verse, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, interestingly, there's a bunch of different interpretations to this parable. Um, and I didn't even realize that, but I'll just go with the one that I've always understood, and I think it's scripturally correct, that makes the most sense to me um, to try and help you understand it. And before we get to the merchant and the, the pearl and whatever, I want to talk about a balance scale. And when, every time I give my testimony, I talk about a balance scale because that's how I understood what getting to heaven was like. Because where I was, when I was raised, I understood that good works and bad works were sort of compared to each other. And that if this side of the balance scale, like you see in science class, if this side of the balance scale was my good works and these were my sins, that if when I died, if the good works exceeded my sins, that I would go to heaven. And if I went the wrong way and all the sins in my life were much more than my good works, that I would go to hell. And that's how I had it sort of figured out in my mind. But see, that's not anywhere in the Bible. That's just something that I came up with. Um, but there is a balance scale that tells us how much our soul is worth. And I was thinking of the verse that says, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? And so if you think about a balance scale, and you think about gaining the whole world, so all the real estate, oceanfront property, and um, you know, just uh, high-rise apartments, and everything that you can imagine, all the cars, all the jewels, all the gold, Everything of value on this planet that people place value on is on one side of the balance scale. That thing would be pretty heavy if you think about everything of value. Gain the whole world is what the verse says. And you put the soul of one person on the other side of the balance scale. And what God is saying is that the soul of one person is of more value to him than the whole world. Because he says, what if a person shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The point that he's trying to make is that your soul is more valuable than all the riches in the world. And the proof of that is that the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross to save our souls. And so when we come to this, this little story, um, we have a merchant man in search of fine pearls. And he goes all over the place seeking. And some people refer to this as God the Father or as the Lord Jesus Christ, um, as the shepherd that's seeking the lost sheep, going all over to find this one pearl. 
And when he finds that pearl of great price, which I perceive to be your soul, my soul, it says that he sold all that he had. And that's why I kind of like to think of this as God the Father, because he gave his most valuable possession, the thing that meant the most to him, an eternal being, never created, always existed. The Father always had a son, and what did he do? He watched his son become a man and come to earth and walk among sinners and be crucified and be executed and be tortured and tormented in front of thousands of people that screamed at him and spit at him and threw things at him and cursed him. That's what he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So something that's incredibly valuable is your soul. Something that's inside of you that will live forever. When recently I was at a cemetery, and I was looking at the different names on the tombstones, and I was thinking about those people, that even though under the ground, and I couldn't see it, that there were coffins with um, bones and maybe some um, decaying clothing inside of those, uh, those uh, caskets, that the soul of that person whose name was on that tombstone was no longer there. For at the moment that that person died, that soul went off into eternity on a trip with one destination. There's only two possible destinations, but when a person dies, that soul's only going one place because its destination has been determined during life. And we still have life. We still have the day of grace. We still have a gospel meeting today on November 15th, 2015. We still have an opportunity to be saved. And so that soul, there's a verse that says, the soul that liveth and it does not, that it liveth and does not die. The soul will live forever, forever in eternity and whether it lives in heaven or in hell is determined by what happens while you're alive here on the earth. And so then the final point that I want to talk about is the most important, and that is the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the price of blood. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. And something that I wanted to share with you is that these three words, when put together, are one Greek word. And some of you have heard that preached on before. And I don't know how to pronounce Greek words, but um, it looks like, in this first sentence, it looks like the word is pronounced to tell us die, to tell us die. Um, this word was also written on business documents or receipts during New Testament times to show or indicate that a bill had been paid in full. And then I'll read a quote from these two uh, men who, uh, on the next slide, that wrote a Greek-English lexicon, which is a book that converts Greek into English. Get to that in a second. But I want you to get the point. So the, this, this Greek word that you see on the screen that I won't try to pronounce again, it means paid in full. And just yesterday, I went to the garage, the, the mechanic that's just up the street from my house. He had done some work on my truck, and the guy's standing there, and I say, I'm here to pay my bill. He pulls it out. It's two pieces of paper, one for himself and the company and their records and one for me, and he tells me how much it is, hand him my credit card, and he pulls out a little rubber stamp, and he hits this one, and he hits this one, and it says paid. And then there's a little place for the date, and then there's a little square for whether it was cash or visa. He, he, he hit it. He hit that thing here and here, and it said paid, and he wrote down the date, and he wrote the word visa, and then he ran it through the machine, and then he gave it one of those copies to me. And so I have a bill. I owed them a certain amount of money for the work that they did. But now I don't have a debt that I owe I have proof that I paid. And see, in the days when the Lord Jesus Christ walked the earth, if someone had a debt, let's say that they went into the marketplace and they didn't have enough money and they needed some food and they needed a little bit of clothing and they would go to a couple different uh, merchants 
and maybe they had a little scroll and, and they would write down what the debt was that this person owed. And then maybe that person took those goods and went out and may, maybe that person was a farmer and, and during the week they sold a couple of sheep and they got some, some coins and they came back into town and they went to that person and they gave them the right number of coins and that person wrote, it is finished, across the top of the page, paid in full. And what these two men, Moulton and Milligan, what they wrote is receipts are often introduced by the phrase to telestai, usually written in an abbreviated manner. The connection between receipts and what Christ accomplished would have been quite clear to John's Greek-speaking readership. It would be unmistakable that Jesus Christ had died to pay for their sins. The Apostle John wrote his gospel for the Greek readers. And so when he put those carefully chosen words that the Lord Jesus did say on the cross, it is finished, they would understand that Jesus was saying paid in full. Because they had seen that before on a debt that they owed in the marketplace. These Greeks knew what that word meant. And so what does it mean to us? It means that the Lord Jesus Christ, we sing it with the kids, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. He never sinned. He didn't have a debt of sin. I have the debt of sin, but I can't do anything to get rid of my sins. He can. And how does he do it? With our last point in our last verse, with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And that word precious is an adjective that means an object, substance, or resource of great value not to be wasted or treated carelessly. And I have a question for you. Do you treat the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ carelessly? And that's a very reverent question, but when you think about it, it's just like the question that was asked that day when they said, what will you do now with Jesus? So if the blood of Jesus Christ is precious, it says it's a substance of great value. That actual, literal, tangible blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed on a cross 2,000 years ago outside of the city walls of Jerusalem, that actual blood, very precious. Why? Because it was the fulfillment of thousands of years of prophecies. It was the fulfillment of that signpost in the Garden of Eden when that animal died and all the signposts throughout the Old Testament when animals would die on Jewish altars. It was pointing ahead to the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says here that something's precious is not to be wasted or treated carelessly. Are we wasting an opportunity by being careless with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so in conclusion... Sin is offensive to God. He can't let sin into heaven because he's perfect. Sins must be forgiven. The only way that sins can be forgiven is through death and blood. That's been the way it has been in God's plan from the very beginning, and he demonstrates that throughout the word of God. And the precious blood of Christ was shed on the cross so that we could be saved and we could have our sins forgiven for all eternity. So, now what? You know, some people say, well, um, salvation is easy to understand, and I'm sure that's frustrating, especially for, for kids who've grown up listening to the gospel that want to be saved and aren't saved. But I think in its simplest form is for someone to realize I'm lost. I'm a sinner. And to realize that I can't get into heaven the way that I am with the sins that I have. And to believe with their whole heart and to be confident that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he paid the price for my sins. And then to accept that belief as fact that the reason that Jesus died on the cross was for my sins personally. That's what salvation is. That's what the gospel is. That is the good news of the gospel of salvation. The precious blood of Christ, it is finished. You know, coming up over the next several weeks, we're going to be spending some money on gifts for people that we care about. 
and different prices, different bargains, different sales, all those different things. But you know what? There's something that is more valuable than anything on this earth, and that's your soul. And there's something that's more valuable than anything in the universe, and that's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to get serious about this matter of salvation and realize that Jesus died for me. And it's our prayer today that you will understand, if you are a sinner, if you are not saved, that you can accept the finished work of Calvary. It is finished, paid in full, and accept it for your debt of sin and be saved for all eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this blessed opportunity that we have had to preach the gospel once again, and we pray for everyone in this audience, whether they be here or online, that they might realize that there's nothing more important than salvation and that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We have an opportunity, but we cannot waste away the time that remains because we don't know how much time we have. We must be born again, and we pray that someone here would get serious about the matter of salvation and that they would realize as a sinner before God that all has been paid and that they can simply accept what's already been done and be saved for all eternity. We pray blessing and salvation from this meeting, from the meetings in Akron and other assemblies around the region, and we ask thee to bless the ministry meeting to follow, for we pray this in the Savior's name. Amen. Okay.